Thank you all very much. It was great to hear some European views represented here. We're going to just remove one chair and then move straight on to the next session. So four of us were chatting in the green room a minute ago and reminded ourselves that when the Aspen Security Forum started, you never would have had a panel on domestic U.S. politics and our domestic divisions. But yesterday, almost every speaker we had brought up how it has become a national security issue that we in the United States seem to be so internally divided. In fact, before the 2020 election, a Pew poll showed that roughly nine in 10, both Democrats and Republicans, worried that a victory by the other party would lead to lasting harm to the United States. This morning, we had protesters outside. We were worried it was for us, but it was actually for Joe Manchin, whose boat is apparently right out there, <laughs> protesting the bill. <laughs> you know, I live in California where it feels less immediate, but coming to the nation's capital, you can feel the intensity of, um, of the partisanship, and it worries me. There's no one better to talk about these issues than Amy Walter, Arthur Brooks, and Susan Glasser, three of our great observers of US domestic and international politics. Amy, of course, is the publisher and editor-in-chief of the Cook Political Report. You hear her often on the PBS NewsHour and elsewhere, and she studies polling and these issues in great detail. Arthur Brooks is both a professor at the Harvard Kennedy School and the Harvard Business School, formerly, of course, president of the American Enterprise Institute and a regular columnist for The Atlantic. And Susan Glasser, one of our great journalists, is now a writer at The New Yorker, uh, but also one of the founders of the award-winning political magazine and one of the great observers of US politics. So I'll let the three of you take it away. Thank you. Well, thank you, Anya. I think uh, you know we are in a situation where protesting a boat seems like the least of our troubles. <laughs> uh, <laughs> but uh, you know, I'm glad you started out with this idea that a panel on the state of American democracy and what is its place in uh, a conference dedicated to national security and foreign policy. Uh, it, it's it's not the kind of thing that we could have imagined really uh, just a few years ago. But I am delighted to be here both with Amy and uh, Arthur because I can't think of two better people who I'd like to help me understand. <laughs> so, uh, you know, Amy, we've had these, not just off your election, but really off, off your elections this week. So I'm gonna start with you because of course I would just call you up anyways and ask you, so now we can have our conversation in front of everybody else. Uh, what just happened here? And does it mean anything? Does it actually tell us anything about the state of our democracy a year after uh, this election that continues to be contested and disputed? I think the latest numbers I saw were that two thirds of self-described Republican voters uh, in polls say they do not accept that the 2020 election uh, was legitimate. So help us understand. So here, here we are. So we'll get into, I think, there's the immediate and then there is what, what is it going to look like in 22 and 24. In the immediate, what happened last night feels very familiar for students of politics, that an off-year election traditionally, almost always, is uh, one where the out party wins. And it makes a whole lot of sense. If you think about, and again, we'll, we'll go back not just the last 10 years or 20 years or 30 years, go back to the 1930s. There were only two exceptions to a party sitting in the White House not losing seats in a midterm election. Now, they happened to ha occur during our lifetimes in 1998 and 2002, but there were extraordinary circumstances to explain those. What happened the other night is very normal. The party that's sitting in the White House, especially a party that's sitting in the White House and has control of all the levers of government, is not living up to expectations of independent voters. The base 
is either complacent or maybe a little dispirited. And the other side, in part because they lost, in part because they're seeing this party that won enacting all the stuff that they really deeply hate is energized. And you put those three things together and that's how you lose even in a state as blue as Virginia and almost come close to losing in a state even bluer like New Jersey. And it, it portends the kind of wipeout midterm elections, tsunami elections that have become sort of the norm for the last really 15 years, right? We've had big consequential midterm elections, 2006, 2010, 2014, 2018, looking like 2022. In fact, for the first time in history, the four presidents in a row have lost control of House, Senate, or both in their tenure as president, All right? They've lost their House and Senate majorities during their tenure, and Joe Biden right now is on the, the, the eve of losing that too. And it gets to the, the other issue here. Why are we in such a volatile time? We're in such a volatile time in part because we're so committed to our partisanship that red and blue are moving further and further away, both geographically, ideologically. We live in different bubbles. We live in different economies. And so the priorities of Dems and the priorities of Republicans do not line up at all. That wasn't the case 20 or so years ago when you could see that the top priorities of Democrats and the top priorities of Republicans were at least in the same ballpark. Now they are miles away from each other. Democrats believe climate change existential threat, number one priority. That's like priority number 700 for Republicans. Republicans believe immigration, number one concern. That is way down on the list for Democrats. And so this back and forth we're gonna see Conti will continue and continue in part because the party gets in, they go overboard, they overcorrect, in other words, right? They say, we're not gonna do what those ter that terrible party did. We're gonna focus on these priorities, which make the other side angry. Independents feel like they're going too far. They've, they've um, overreached, they check them, and then we go back and do it again. So the pendulum going back and forth is has become something now of a norm. Well, you know, it's really an interesting point, Arthur, that I want to explore because it seems almost paradoxical. We've had enormous swings and a very volatile uh, control of Congress, control of the White House, going back and forth. And yet at the same time, partisan identities are becoming more fixed than ever. Uh, uh, you look at Donald Trump's approval rating for the four years of his presidency, and it's mostly a straight line. Uh, Biden, interestingly, has sort of started out higher and has now gone down to Trump-like levels. But it, it seems to me there's almost a tension here between our ever more fixed and immutable partisan tribal identities and this political system that's careening back and forth. So how, how do you make sense of that? Well, there's no, there's no sense to be made of this, <laughs> um, but there's a lot of regret that I think that we should all share at this point about how partisan identity is actually ripping the country apart. This is not a normal situation in which we have disagreements that can be in you know, constant equilibrium. I mean, there's lots of disagreements I have that I will take to the grave with my wife and there's no chance we're getting divorced. You can, be in, for you. you can be in disagreement forever with people with whom you're in communion and people that you actually love and with whom you live in community and you plan to do so forever, but that's not the situation that we have today. Now, just as a reminder to all of us, because this is the Aspen Security Forum, the greatest gift that the United States can give to our international foes is hating each other most. That's the greatest gift that we can give to them. Why? Because that is the ultimate distraction. If 90% of Democrats and 90% of Republicans say on election day, and again, this is Amy's world, and so I say this with appropriate humility. I mean, this is literally the greatest person in the country to talk about this. If 90% approximately of both of, of voters in both parties say the main reason that they're voting is because they're afraid of the other side, and more than 50% of the people in each one of the parties says that the greatest threat to this country are people on the other side politically, this is a bow-wrapped Christmas present for the Chinese. Now let's think about what this actually means. And, and this means different things for us as policy wonks, but just as a personal matter. 
I'm the father of a forward deployed combat Marine who is currently in the Pacific standing by. Now think about this. What does this mean to a Lance Corporal in the Marine Corps, just a normal guy who's looking back at American politics, paying attention, pretty aware, and what he sees is that Americans think that each other are the enemy, and he's standing by that something might happen next door in Taiwan, which looks increasingly likely. This, my friends, is our fault. And this is an unforced error that we're walking into. So the real question for me, and I'll get off the political turf because this is, Amy's much better on this than me, I'll talk about the social science of this a little bit because that's what I do for a living. There's a lot of literature that shows that this is a very normal pattern that we see in countries. And the main reason that we find permanent schisms between citizens and countries who are just brothers and sisters, I mean, community members, neighbors, who disagree on politics and policy and how the conceit of those differences can blow themselves up into a cold civil war and sometimes a hot civil war, thank God that's not where we are today, is because of a phenomenon, a cognitive phenomenon that we in my business uh, call motive attribution asymmetry. Now that's a situation in which intractable conflict that can go on for years or even generations or centuries in the case of the Balkans, for example, occurs because both sides believe there's an error here. Both sides believe that they're motivated by love for their country and community, and the other side is motivated by hatred for them. Very, very common. It, it actually, and, and it's an error because both sides to a conflict cannot, by axiom, be motivated simultaneously by love and hatred. <laughs> Somebody's wrong, usually both, according to the research, but that's what is, is, lies behind the Balkan conflicts, the Rwandan genocide, the Palestinian and Israeli conflicts. And by the way, that's also behind most divorces. Is motive attribution asymmetry. She says, I love, but he hates. And he says, no, no, no. I'm the one who loves, but she's the one who hates. Now, that's an error, which is incredible news. That's an incredible opportunity, because when you have an error in communication that undergirds the conflict, if you can solve the error, you can break through the problem. But we're not doing it because we have leadership that's profiting from the error. We have leadership that's actually making money in the media and getting votes in politics or just getting jollies and followers in social media to gin up more and more and more of the motive attribution asymmetry leading to this culture of contempt. It's weakening our country. And those of you who are, have much greater expertise than me on strategic international matters know that this can end in a very, very dark place and it's completely unnecessary. So I, before I go back to Amy, I wanna, I wanna ask a quick Follow-up question, to what extent in the social science models does actual ideology play a role? Because really what you're describing to a certain extent is, is more in the realm of psychology, is more in the realm of human behavior. So it, it, people define ideology in all sorts of different ways. Largely these are cultural issues. And they're, 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 it's funny, you know, politics is downstream from culture, economics is downstream from culture. I'm an economist, so I'd like to think that everything is downstream from economics, but I have to recognize the fact that culture is really what predominates. And when we have these cultural issues in our country that we can't seem to resolve, but, but more importantly, that really are being exacerbated by, by leaders that are profiting from us hating each other, then those cultural issues are gonna take on more and more and more significance. We're not going to actually see the areas in which, the, in the very large areas in which we are in uh, in, in, in communion with each other. It's interesting, when I brought in, in social science experiments, when I brought people together um, to see whether or not they could discuss politics in new ways, who can't when they don't see each other, when they're in their, you know, their, their, their echo chambers of social media and their, their cable news network of choice. And, I mean, these cable news networks are, are profiting from hatred is basically what's going on here. And I say, well, maybe I could do something differently. What I do in the experiments is I'll take the, the farthest fringe of right-wing populists and the farthest fringe of the cultural left, and I'll bring people together and I'll say, you're gonna talk about politics, but first I want you to talk to each other about your kids. I want you to talk to each other about your kids. And they talk to each other about their kids and, 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 and they're talking about their shared love which literally activates a different, the different neural substrates in the brain than anything you could do when you're discussing politics, and they can't hate each other after that. And by the way, if they, if they have teenage kids, then they're bonded even more by a common enemy. <laughs> <laughs> and right you know, here, in my case, I got you. It's like, I, I was saved by the US Marine Corps, thank God. You know? <laughs> but, but, 
this is really important for us to figure out because the, the framing of our national conversation, if it actually starts with our shared loves, we win. Because we love America and we love each other and every single person in this room, we are sisters and brothers and you know it's true. And yet, if we start with politics, we start by activating different parts of the human brain in which we focus on the 10th most important thing that we actually don't have in common and then we start to see somehow the illusion that we're more different than we are the same. All right, so Washington. We are in Washington, Amy, in the land of small differences that end up being big differences. Yeah. Um, Arthur just said that our leaders are profiting you know, from this hate and division, but I'm struck by you know, Biden, a lot of his appeal, and, and it was the idea that by not being a divider, he could you know, bridge, bridge the gap. That hasn't happened. Uh, is that why he's so stuck right now? I think part of the reason he's so stuck right now, and then I'm going to ask both of you a question, is um, he, the promise of the Biden presidency was normalcy. We were going to return to normal. Now, normal meant different things to different people. right? For some people, it meant we're just going to have a traditional president. He's not going to tweet at midnight. He's not going to get in petty fights. We're not going to be embarrassed by things he says or does. We're just going to go back to the presidents we've always known. Other people, normal was like, COVID's going to be over. We're going to get back to our normal lives. I want my kids back in school. I want to be able to sit in a room like this. I want to get on an airplane. There was another group, though, that said normal is going back to what the world should be, my world, hmm. right? Not the world that Republicans believe exists. We're going to, right? We march in the streets against police violence. We're going to solve those problems. We're going we're gonna to address racial injustice. We're going to address the immigration situation and people fleeing their countries to come to the U.S. We are going to finally address these elephants in the room and Democrats are going to be the ones that stand at the forefront. And then every single one of those things, maybe not that he's acting normal. So he's, he's not tweeting. So we got that. Every other of those normals hasn't really happened. And so there's just a deepening sense that either one, okay, I guess this is just what we're in for. Politics is dysfunctional. These people are inept. There is no way to get us to a better place. Um, so there is, that is, I think, so much of his challenge. So whether you're very far on the left and you're saying, he's not fighting for us. Democrats have let us down. What, you know, we weren't marching in the streets in the summer of 2020 for more infrastructure, right? Yay! We want an infrastructure bill. We want it now. Roads no, and bridges. Roads and roads bridges. And... <laughs> Isn't that what they're marching for? Right? And the, the folks who are sitting uh, in the suburbs of America said, I just wanted to get my life back. I hear this over and over again from voters who say, I just thought things would be better by now. I don't understand why we're still fighting about vaccines. I don't understand where the president is. Where's the leadership there? Where's the unity there? And I don't understand why, you know, prices are going up. Things are happening that feel like we're back and spiraling into another bad place economically. So then the question comes, all right, how do we break out of this seeming sense of dysfunction? And traditionally, you would point to some big disaster. Okay, that will bring Americans together. If we can't come together by love, maybe we can come together on a shared sense of I don't know, we're, we're all in this together, or that we have a shared enemy, right? That always helps. So that's my question to you, which is, if indeed we're at this very risky place, would a conflict internationally help unite the United States? Hmm. You think so? You're asking me, Amy? I'm asking both of you. <laughs> so Susan, I love your view. Uh, yeah. Moderator's privilege. Um, look, what's interesting is that you haven't, you, you've seen some efforts, uh, especially on China, to pivot both uh, in the Democratic foreign policy world and the Republican foreign policy world. There's been a striking convergence in the last few years mm -hmm. around some very familiar rhetoric to people who followed the Cold War. But the country doesn't seem to be in that place. Uh, the sense of urgency uh, has not taken us there. Uh, Taiwan uh, right. is the is one it, thing is the U.S. Could, but is, are the U.S. citizens going to be like, yeah, right, I don't see that. Let's go and defend Taiwan. Yeah. No. No. 
So it's interesting because every 10 years we have what feels like an, almost an existential crisis or at least a massive disequilibrium. Yeah. And, and we're always really shocked by it. But we shouldn't be, literally every 10 years. I mean, so if you're older than 30, you were really little, for example, if you're in your early 30s or late 20s like my, my graduate students, um, when the Soviet Union melted down, changing geopolitics pretty much permanently. And if you lived anywhere outside the United States, particularly in Eastern Europe, it fundamentally changed Everything. your life. 10 years later was 9-11. 10 years later, more or less, was the financial crisis. 10 years later was the coronavirus epidemic. And every time we're like, whoa, this, is, this can never happen. Well, guess what? 10 years from now, something big like that's going to happen. 10 years from now, we're going to have a major disequilibrating international crisis that's going to never should have happened, couldn't happen, we can't imagine it, and we're going to still be paying attention to, to viral pandemics and financial crises because we're always looking at the last two yeah. behind yeah, us, yeah. right? Yeah. The really interesting thing is the extent to which leadership matters to use these catalytic events to, as Rahm Emanuel one time said, he got pilloried for this, but he's exactly right, not letting a crisis go to waste. That's an incredibly entrepreneurial way of thinking. The difference between the entrepreneurial mindset and the conventional mindset is that where ordinary people say, this is terrible, I wish it weren't here, what can we do to avoid it, let's press against it, let's get rid of it, let's get it behind us as fast as we can, entrepreneurs say, what's the opportunity in this for us to make progress? So it's, it's as simple as walking down the street and your friends are all saying there's no, no good bars and restaurants in this neighborhood and you're thinking, I'm gonna open a bar. To, there are people starving in the world. That's your opportunity to lift people up and bring them together through greater international relief. That's the entrepreneurial mindset. And so what great leaders are supposed to do is to look at these moments and say, this is a moment of, of incredible crisis, of hardship, of trauma, of challenge. This is our opportunity to bring people together, to lift people up and bring them together in our country and make our country stronger. And we wasted that. In, at, in the coronavirus. We, we wasted that through it, partisan bickering and making it an incredibly political phenomenon. Okay, but this, this I want to go back actually to our topic here overall, which is the state of American democracy, and, and to try to understand from each of you in your own perspectives the extent to which this is actually or is not an exceptional crisis, because that really right. shapes it. Is the crisis the crisis of democracy, or are these more in the nature of cyclical crises, like you're talking about, Arthur, uh, a pandemic, a financial crisis? What I want to know from each of you is a year after an election where an American president essentially refused to accept the results of the election, refused to accept the legitimacy of the system, are we just you know, saying, like, oh, no, actually, that was just in this, the scheme of things, uh, not the exceptional crisis? Is that something we've absorbed and moved on from or not? And if not, what are your indicators? What metrics do each of you use to tell yourselves, you know, here's where I think we are uh, in terms of American democracy? Uh, yes, yeah. so it is the essential question, mm. right? And I try not to be someone who is an alarmist. I don't ring the bell very often. Uh, January 6th was definitely a bell ringing moment. And then it, the period after that, right, with the number of elected officials and people who knew better, who were willing to accept these lies about an election, number one, and were willing to push ahead on these audits, and we shouldn't even call them audits because that gives them an air of legitimacy that they do not deserve, but the sense that yes, our elections can never be trusted. Now, interestingly enough though, this is a very ephemeral feeling about whether you can trust elections or not. If you go back and you look at where we were in 2017, uh, overwhelmingly Republicans said, oh, I totally believe in elections. They're fair and safe and they're accurate. And only about half of Democrats believe that. Now, fast forward, obviously, majority, of, overwhelmingly, 90% of Democrats say the elections are fair and accurate and they're wonderful. Republicans, of course not. Now, the gap between Democrats who believed it was not fair and then is now fair is smaller than the gap between Republicans who believed it. So Democrats were not as overwhelmingly negative about 2016 and its accuracy as Republicans are now, but the, the shift was still quite notable 
in both sides, that when you lose, and there is an error somewhere there, whether it's Russians or Facebook, or whether it's you know, elected officials and machines that are hooked up to outer space or whatever the belief was about where these votes came from, that's sort of endemic, but it, is not, uh, it does not suggest that it's gonna sit there forever and ever and ever. What worries me is if indeed we get to the place where um, it's not just partisans, but it is the people who've been sort of saving us from ourselves, people who are local elected officials, it's people who are independent voters, people who show up and vote who aren't part of these tribes. Those are the ones, they are a small, small, small group. We're really depending on this very narrow majority, this very narrow slice of Americans to basically save us from ourselves, from eating the, you know, eating up the other side. Um, and thus far, they've, they've proven to be pretty good at, at doing that. Um, I also think it helps not only to have a leader who's taking charge to try to unify, but at least a leader who's not setting things on fire, right? And, t and lowering the temperature is somewhat helpful. But the culture piece, I think we can't understate and undersell. What happened in Virginia the other day, and New Jersey as well, it's not simply you know, this idea that, well, you know, uh, Democrats are, uh, you know, they've, they've, they've gone too far to the left, they're losing, in, they're losing suburban voters, this is about education. When you look at the numbers in rural America, those voters turned out at an incredible level and they gave an even bigger percent of the vote to those Republican gubernatorial candidates who ran as like sort of middle of the road Republicans than they gave to Donald Trump. Mm. So this gap now between, we're in a war between real America and not real America, that is the, that's the battle right now. Mm. <clears throat> we always, there's a, there's a, a presentism bias in the human mm -hmm. mind, which is to say that this time is different. We always do this. And, and you go back through history and you'll find that commentators and pundits are, have always said this time is different. And Amy quite appropriately said, I don't know. You know, this is a really wild thing, but I don't know. And, and by the way, one of the really profound things that you just did is, is to explain what we call the my side bias phenomenon, the confirmation bias that's endemic in the way that, that humans always think, which is to say, you know, that the elections are free and fair when I'm winning and they're, they're really, really bad and corrupt when I'm losing. And, and again, that's not both sidesism. I mean, we see slight differences in the percentages, but the, tr the, 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 the truth of the matter is when, you ha when this is in the air, people are going to use it. Now, but back to the main point, is this different or is this not different? I was having a conversation a couple of years ago and I was bemoaning this problem of, of intense polarization in American politics with a filmmaker, Ken Burns, the filmmaker. And he had just finished his Vietnam film and he said, you really think it's worse than ever? And I said, I don't know, it seems that way. And he says, well, actually, do you know how many, do you remember the last couple of domestic political terrorist bombings in America? Right. <laughs> and, and I said, the last two, I don't know, I think there was that guy in New Jersey, but I don't think the bomb went off. And, or something like, I don't remember what it was. And he said, how many do you think there were in 1968 and 1969? Domestic political terrorist bombings that were right. successful, 700. In 1968, 1969, right. that really felt different. So I went back and asked some of my colleagues. You know, the nice thing about being at, at, at teaching at a university is that you know I'm 57 and I'm like the youth movement. <laughs> <laughs> and and uh, that's tenure, folks. Anyway, so um, and so I asked some of my colleagues, did it feel different? And they're like, oh yeah, we thought this was the end of democracy. We thought this was the end of democracy at the you know, Vietnam War, and then unbelievable amounts of domestic unrest, even terrorism, yep. and then Watergate. I mean, it's like the end of, that's the end of the experiment, man. Yep. It's the end of the experiment. Yep. And a few years later, there was an, a period of almost unprecedented stability. Right. There wasn't agreement, but there was actual stability. So, so what does this kind of tell us? Now, there are a bunch of theories about this. One is, again, this presentism bias that this time is different and it never is. That's a, an empirical regularity, as we like to say in my business. But there's also one other thing to kind of keep in mind. It's, um, I'm married to an immigrant and, and my wife 
one time said, you, you funny thing about you Americans, I mean, many funny things about us Americans, but she says, you never actually solve any problems. <laughs> you just leave them behind. Yep. You know, it's like you take a bag of trash <laughs> out of your car and leave it by the side of the road and go speeding off. <laughs> and you all just decide that it wasn't as big a problem as you thought. <laughs> and I thought about it and then I went to the literature and it turns out that the worst piece of, the single worst piece of advice you can get for your marriage is to make sure you never go to bed angry. <laughs> That's a really stupid piece of advice because you'll be fighting all night long. <laughs> <laughs> what you should do is go to bed angry and then wake up and say it wasn't that big a deal. Leave your problems behind. <laughs> so here's my hypothesis. And maybe five years from now I'll be repudiating this and I'll be looking at this clip on YouTube and feeling really embarrassed. Mm. But I believe that this time is bad, but it's not different. It's one of a long string of events in which polarization becomes really intense. I think that what's going to happen in the coming years is that we're going to agree that it's okay for us to leave a lot of these disagreements and problems behind, and we're going to find a greater period of peace. What I want to get there, what I want to do is get there faster. I want to get there as fast as possible. And that means we need leaders who say it's time for us to not disagree less, but to disagree better. And the way to do that is to say it's perfectly okay for us to have disagreements and still love each other. So I want to make sure we get a couple questions in before we go. I, I have to say, I've already learned something, which is a new form of self-soothing in the uh, age of partisanship is thinking about the bombings of the Vietnam era. <laughs> Jane Harmon has a question for us. Yeah, it's We're coming to the mic. <laughs> The legendary and great Jane Harmon. <laughs> well, in my business, you are. Legendary, anyway. Yeah. Uh, Arthur, so even better than talking about children is talking about grandchildren. Uh, uh, that's so I hear, I hear it's the best. Just so, so you know. It's God's reward for not killing your children. That, here. that is yeah. exactly yeah. right. Uh, but so my question is wh whether the lack of physical proximity is one of the biggest villains here. And I would just remember 100 years ago when I was a lowly staffer in the US Senate, and senators lived here full time. Their kids were on the same little league teams on the weekend. And oh my God, some of them even uh, roomed together. Um, we used to have congressional delegations that went places for more than five minutes. And senators and members of, even members of Congress, imagine, got to know each other. Yeah. And I'm just wondering whether, at least with respect to the broken Congress that we have and the broken business model in Congress, uh, changing the schedule and forcing people to get to know each other and maybe even share pictures of children and grandchildren mm -hmm. would make a huge difference in how Congress functions. Yeah, for, well, there's, yeah, there's, a, there's a ton of research on that, Jane, that, that you're really aware of, too, that when people don't have physical proximity to each other, they can turn each other into cartoon stereotypes. That's just the way it is. It's also very, very easy for others to fire them up against. But this is a, this is a problem of um, my, my, my colleague, Robert Putnam, at, at the Harvard Kennedy School talks about bonding versus bridging social capital. Bonding social capital is where you, you talk an awful lot about the things that you have in common and you bond with people with whom you have actual similarity. And it's fine as far as it goes. The problem is it creates in-groups and out-groups. What we really, really want to have a better society is bridging social capital where the, the sense of connection that we have actually transcends differences on purpose. Great leaders are bridgers is how, what it comes. But, but leaders are people too. And the truth of the matter is we have a tendency to treat our, kind of the, our, our, our politicians as if they were you know, China dolls or there was something in a storefront that they have less than human emotions, that they don't read their social media and feel hurt, that you can trash them, that you can cut them and they won't bleed. And I have a lot of friends on the Hill. I have a lot of very, very close friends in the House and Senate and they're just like everybody else. It turns out they need friendship. You know, the whole thing is that it's very easy in our society today for those of us who work hard in any profession, but particularly in politics, to have no real friends, only deal friends. And that's not a good substitute. It's a very isolating, a very lonely thing. It's a very depressing and anxiety provoking thing as well. And so it's easy to be, to be pushed into a scenario in which you only have a couple of people that are your political deal friends. You don't know anybody on the other side. Your constituents are especially your most vocal constituents, AKA primary voters that are trying to fire you up. And so that you can show appropriate levels of hatred within your incredibly gerrymandered district. All of these things are coming together, but all of the principles to solve this are just human principles. 
The same way that you would get to know your neighbors, the same way that you would get to know anybody else, the same way that you're trying not to fight at the Thanksgiving table. It works for absolutely everybody because at the end of the day, we are just human beings that are built for love and are being pushed away from it by a relatively toxic culture. Amy, in, in oh, this, go ahead. It, it, these were statewide races, though, in Virginia and New Jersey. They were not gerrymandered right. uh, districts. What did you take from you know the the winning message of of Glenn Youngkin in Virginia? Was that a a uniting or a dividing message? What well, was? Uh, he was able to take advantage of a national environment that was had a little bit of a tailwind for him, much bigger headwind for Terry McAuliffe, and talk about issues in a way that was non-threatening, right? We talk a lot, or if you watch news, there was so much focus on, uh, well, you know, Glenn Youngkin made this critical race theory the, the centerpiece of his campaign. Actually, if you watch his ads, he never talks about critical race theory. He talks about the fact that people are feeling frustrated about their schools, which is true. If anybody was parenting a child through school during COVID, it was horrible. And that has also moved into all kinds of other topics about what is happening to their kids at school currently, what has happened in the past. It all came together at a time where 70% of Americans think the country's headed in the wrong direction. So. To Arthur's point, he took a crisis and he didn't let it go to waste. Mm -hmm. People are already feeling anxious, frustrated. What's one thing that you know, again, for people who turn out to vote in elections, especially midterm elections, parents, they're a pretty good constituency, get them right at that moment and at that place, undercut what is a traditionally democratic issue, in part because people are already so frustrated by what they felt. The one thing to just address Jane's question that's important, it's not just about the members themselves, it's the voters who put them there. Mm. We only have six states, this is the lowest number since the direct election of senators, six states that have a split Senate delegation. That used to be the norm. You'd have 20 or more states where you'd have a Democrat and a Republican. No better way to understand the other side than to have to go and, you know, how does one state elect Wisconsin is one of those rare ones that's still left. Tammy Baldwin, way over here on the left, and Ron Johnson, way over here on the right, okay? Now, those two are not friends. You don't have to be as dramatic as that, but even a place like Colorado where you had two pretty centrist members, that doesn't exist anymore, and it can't exist anymore. And that's voters who are just going down the line and just picking D, 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 R, 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 all the way down to the county council level. And so you can try, you know, what, what really worked is when the district next to you or your, the senator who sat on the plane with you was from a different party. And that's voters' decision to send all the same kinds of people. And then when you have a caucus that represents all rural, small town, exurban America over here on the right, and on the left, a caucus that represents just urban and densely suburban America, and it's not just coastal, okay? This isn't a flyover country versus the coasts. This is densely populated America, less densely populated America. Each have a constituency, but there, there's no intermingling. Hmm. Used to be, but that doesn't happen. Yeah, we actually have a couple of, and the, the nice thing about state and local politics is there's, there's a lot more to be positive about. You know, we're in Washington, D.C., so the national, the, our, our local business is national politics. But and I lived here for a long time, and then I moved, and now I live in Massachusetts, and it's completely different. Massachusetts has the most popular governor in America, a guy named Charlie Baker. He's a great governor. Why is he a great governor? Well, because he's a moderate Republican in a very left-wing state. And he is doing whatever he has to do to get as much progress as possible while not hiding his views. It's an extraordinary thing. I just have huge amounts of admiration for him. And by the way, what is he gonna do if he decides to run for reelection? He's 65 years old, he has to make that decision, and which by the way is like, is a kid by national political standards today. Um, you know, he won't even be, uh, if he wants to run for president, he has to wait till his late 70s, I think. Uh, and, and, but Charlie Baker, what he can do, which would be really interesting, is he's never a jerk. He's normal. He has a normal family life. He's kind of a policy wonk. 
He wants to bring people in with consensus and compromise. And he's going to get a, a very fringy uh, a Trump approved primary yeah. if he decides to run. And then he's going to get a far cultural left opponent in the general. And Charlie Baker is so popular that he could run a political clinic on both sides. Mm -hmm. Wax the right and then wax the left. Wouldn't that be great? Wouldn't, I mean, from my point of view, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm showing my bias that I want people to actually be able to make progress. Everybody knows he's a pro-life conservative guy. Everybody knows that. But everybody knows that his job as governor is to represent all the citizens of Massachusetts, most of whom don't share his political views, and he's willing to do that. And in so doing, he can win. That wins state in state, in many state and local elections like in, it, with many, many constituencies. And so I think that there's more for us to be there's more for us to be enthusiastic about than we really are when we're talking about national politics. Do you agree with that, Amy? Somewhat. Yeah. Um, All right. So Amy, anyway, you get the last word because we're uh -oh. almost out of time. Yes. But I, I do want to bring it back to you know, where we are looking ahead to the midterms next year and to you know, how much it matters that the country's numbers in terms of wrong track, you talked about that before, uh, a sense really across the ideological spectrum that things aren't going the way we wanted them. Right. What are the consequences? Is it possible for President Biden to regroup? I mean, you, you talked in terms of almost historical inevitability. Right. Uh, there you is know, that something. we already know the outcome of next year's midterm. Can that really be the case? Um, the, the best thing that can happen for the president between now and next fall, the economy has to get better. People have to start feeling this return to normalcy, stability. Their life has gotten back. Some of that, he can, he can regroup. You know, Donald Trump at this point in his uh, first year was at a much lower place. And he spent, most, he spent 2018 kind of digging out of the hole that he dug for himself in 2017. He didn't get to a great place. They still lost 40 seats in the House, but they didn't lose the Senate. And they could have lost many more seats, I would argue, had there not been, at the very end of that campaign, the Kavanaugh hearings, which really ginned up enthusiasm from the Republican base. So the, the challenge for Biden is, one, get things stable so that there isn't the cliff right now in terms of the, the sense of, of anxiety and frustration from independents, but but also the sense of disillusionment from Democrats, get to a place too where the Democratic base feels as if their investment in the party was worth it. If they feel like it doesn't matter that Democrats are in charge, they're not gonna show up and vote. Republicans are absolutely gonna show up and vote. And then we'll have divided government for the last two years of uh, Biden's term, which will mean more gridlock, which in some ways, interestingly enough, does mean more stability, right? <laughs> gridlock equals stability because neither side gets yeah. to feel like the other side's overreaching. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there you go. Then everything will be fine. Yeah. <laughs> Done. All right. So I did, not, I did not think we could have a positive conversation <laughs> about the state of American democracy, but See, I guess this is what can passes try. for positive. Gridlock is good. We're not getting divorced. Uh, is that, that's sort of the takeaway here. Also, it's not Vietnam. So I want to thank Amy Walter. I want to thank Arthur Brooks. What a fantastic thank conversation. You.